I um, wanted to do this workshop on trauma because, and this is not a one-on-one, this is like a basic trauma workshop that turned into 27 slides for me. And it is, there's so much to it. Um, and I found in my practice and, 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 and being a clinician and a family educator, um, this is the root. We have to understand trauma. And I think as basic society, we do not understand trauma. So I wanted to do this. And I actually, like, it took me about a month to go through three different books. I've listened to a 10 day trauma workshop that was free from, you know, from, from anywhere from, I mean, there was three people that spoke in a 10 day period. So I've listened to probably a dozen um, workshop in the last 10 days on, on trauma, which ended up just being, uh, you know, coincidental that I, that there was a trauma workshop that I had signed up for and listened to. But, um, and, and I've listened to um, several books and this is the one I'll go over a lot. Um, this is a very deep book and I've listened to um, Lost Connections over this last month. And so those two books are always referenced. The thing is about all these is I, I always take like three books and basically put it into an hour of a, of a kind of a, a I call it a paperback um, review. So there's so much to this. So I'm going to get through it <laughs> and quickly. And then there, whatever is left and what we don't, you know, it's on the, it's on the slide. So I thought I'm just going to put it on the slide anyways, and we'll probably have to go skim through it really quickly. So there's my information. So benefit, that's, uh, what uh, Blomquist Hell does, we have um, a 24-7 crisis line in education, and we're doing video and phone and face-to-face -face if we're not in Salt Lake County right now, but um, the benefit is here. But this benefit is for anyone and everyone um, that can access these workshops. So trauma, this is what we're going to go over. What's going on? We have to know what's going on. And we we just have to know what's going on. Um, and we actually don't. And this is what I found in my practice is that people have a really, really misunderstanding about trauma. And then what's the, and this is about what's going on in the brain with trauma, the types of trauma, the basic types of trauma, um, which aren't basic anymore. They're broad. Um, the reactions and the effects and the impacts of trauma. The root issues and treatment, you know, we've got to go over like, okay, here's a root issue and here's maybe some treatment, just some basic treatment. Um, how do we release uh, chemicals, which is emotions, which is, you know, emotions or chemicals, chemicals or emotions. How do we release that? How do we, how do we tap into the unhurt instead of just the hurt? Um, my favorite P words, I have a little slide on that. Um, and then how do we gain resilience and connection? Because that is proven to combat shame and trauma. So, and depression actually, and addiction actually, connection. So that's the, that's the book Lost Connections that I absolutely adore and, um, and many others. Of, of all of Brené Brown's research of 20 years on shame and trauma and how the resilience of that and how to combat that is connection. Plain and simple, that word, connection. So you think about uh, what trauma does. Well, it disconnects. It disconnects our body, our brain, our soul, our spirit. It disconnects. So that's the that's the opposite. So what's going on in the brain? I'm a brain. Pr this is like my slide that I use in like every single thing I ever teach because I love it. So it's like okay, frontal lobes. We have to understand. And any I'm this is like a dozen times. So if you've watched these prior, you've got this down now. So here's frontal lobes. We have a thought, and then we have a physical reaction, uh, a physiological reaction. If we're going to have one, we have self-talk. This is frontal lobes where we have reason, logic, and emotion. So when we are in the opposite, in the, in the midbrain and trauma and fight or flight, we are not in the frontal lobes. We don't have reasoning. We don't organize our thoughts. We don't have emotion and logic together, which is wise mind. We are not using our wise mind. Um, so just know that that's what the frontal lobes are and they're present. When we're not in our frontal lobes, we are not present. So, so the midbrain.
So that's back here. That's where we have our fight or flight, our response brain, our survival brain, our flooding, our flashbacks, our rumination. We, we have all this mental health issues in the, in the midbrain. We have our root issues back there. That's where our chemicals change and our genes actually change. Um, it's our survival stress response. So if we're ruminating, we're not present. We are not present. If, and I call it marinating. So I like, I like food and mountains. That's like, so all like either reservoirs. I was, I was raised on every reservoir in Utah. Um, and I was raised in the mountain. I mean, like literally. So it's like, and, and of course we're going to have to have ribs with that. So, so here's marination. Here's ruminating. We're going to marinate our ribs and we're going to marinate them and marinate, marinate them and marinate them and marinate them and soak them and soak them. And it's like, when in the world are we going to cook them? That's rumination. We're going to keep going back. We're just going to sit there and soak. So that's what I call rumination. So don't, don't marinate your ribs. Just marinate them overnight. And that's it. Um, okay. This is my other favorite slide. Fight, flight, or freeze. It's once again, the midbrain. So here's, here's what happens with our cortisol. And if you want to look up the, um, the adrenal gland, um, I love Dr. Berg. He has three little YouTube uh, videos on the adrenal gland. The adrenal glands inside of us that sends cortisol to our body, which is the physiological response system of fight, flight, or freeze of this little cortisol, our, our immune system goes down like this little picture over here. This is the cycle. Here's the adrenal gland. And when the adrenal glands burned out, our insides and, and everything else is not going to be uh, functioning as a, a high capacity to combat this. So the thing about this is I've correlated fight, flight, or freeze with aggressive, passive, aggressive, and passive. This, these are things that we do as a relationships in our life. So if we're going to be in fight, we're going to be aggressive. If we're in flight, uh, we're going to be passive aggressive. We're just going to be like, oh, you know, I, yeah, I'll come all your lawn, grandma, but I know that I'm going to be a lagoon. So I'll just say yes. And I really mean no. And that's really passive aggressive. So it's a flight. He, he's supposed to go, you know, mow grandma's lawn, but grandma waits for him all day and he never shows up. Well, that was, you know, cause he knew he was not going to be able to, but he just kind of said yes to make her happy. And then, but he really meant no. So passive is just freeze. And I could go on, 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 and on, and on about this one. Um, everyone else is right. This is the one that I teach on the most about that, that scares me the most. That is the most um, damaging, actually. Um, you think, oh, well, a person that's aggressive is really, you know, really abusive. These are all abuse, but passive is is um, is a deeper um, stuffer and stonewaller and freezer, and that turns into extreme mental health, you know, um, issues and codependency and a lot of other things. And that's a whole other class. And assertive, of course, is the opposite of these three. Um, you're direct with respect. And the only thing that I ever need anyone to know or teach it, if they're like, oh, I need to be, I need to put boundaries up. I need to be more assertive. Um, I feel I need, and I will. Those are the three things that you ever need to say. You know, I feel really disappointed. I really feel disrespected. I need you to stop yelling at me. And I'm willing to talk to you after you stop yelling at me after lunch. Simple, simple verbiage, but it's not. It's difficult <laughs> to be assertive, but that's because you're in your frontal lobes. The other three are in the back. Remember, here's assertive. You're reasoning, you're organizing your thoughts, you're straight, you're, you have logic and emotion together, you're using your wise mind. That was last class. So just re resurface that and go, okay, I'm going to go look at the emotional intelligence class because it's essential to know what you feel. So you have to be emotionally intelligent first. Now, why are we talking about this? I, I thought this class was on trauma. Where, where do you think trauma is held? I mean, this is like, I would, I love interaction, but it's really hard for me to do Zoom sometimes because I like want to ask lots of questions and have a discussion, but it's okay. It's a, it's a short hour. So the question is, where is trauma held? Well, it's actually held in the whole body because this is called the body keeps score. He is number one of 40 years of PTSD studies 
and you know every everything you want to know about trauma now this book i keep on i think oh i'm not going to bring up this book yet this book is extremely deep do not read it <laughs> do not read it it is examples of extreme abuse of of veterans of sexual of of long term but the thing is is just take a chapter just take one chapter and this is how i tell people to read a book don't ever read the whole book and don't read it from from to from to beginning you can do whatever you want i don't tell people what to do but this is the example your brain this is your brain on trauma just read that chapter running your life body brain connection losing your body losing yourself that's a great chapter so the minds of children yeah it's 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 traumatizing um the healing from trauma okay but the thing is is he goes through lots of his practice of dealing with really deep traumas with people so it's okay it's just a very deep thick book um but it's brain mind and body how we hold trauma is inside the body and back here okay midbrain we're not present when we're in trauma we're when we've had trauma we're not and when we're ruminating about trauma when we're marinating trauma we are not in the present so that's why we have to understand this part it's a very stressful response brain when you are in trauma so these are the two types i'm going to check my so so these are kind of um this was hard for me i mean there is so much to this and so i tried to just make make it simple but this is like as you can tell um so not simple um it is very very um very very complex and yes Brene Brown says that we carry shame um uh, let's see say that trauma can be carried in shame so yes so guess what this whole half of this powerpoint's about shame so yes and um I've listened to the audio on all these books. So yes, audio is great because you can just kind of skip over it, you know, too. You can just kind of listen to your, listen to it. So the thing is, is we don't understand. This is why I want to do this. This is my biggest dilemma in therapy is um, most folks don't understand what relational trauma is and developmental trauma, honestly. Like we just don't understand what that is. And so I try to just put examples of just the basics. Relational trauma is ongoing. Type two is this chronic ongoing, ongoing. I mean, we, we continually have the trauma after it's over. Um, we ruminate on it, we marinate it, and then we re-traumatize through other relations. And then developmental trauma is, is zero to 18 is something that's happened to us with our upbringing so doesn't that affect our attachment in adulthood absolutely that's a whole other class too attachment in adulthood and that's where the developmental the rad um comes in i wish it would be called developmental trauma this guy you know this this i can't say his name he's german tried to he talks about developmental trauma in this book he has many many research um, studies and articles about that and he we have basically one thing in the dsm that says yep you've had some you've had some rad you've had some 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 attachment issues in your childhood or you've had ptsd that's it that's all we have it doesn't talk about relational trauma it doesn't talk about developmental trauma it doesn't talk about trauma very much at all and i think that needs to change so we need to have like okay this could be depression oh no it's not depression it's actually trauma it's not depression because depression and trauma mirror each other so does um low iron and depression so does hyperthyroidism and depression they all mirror each other so there's so many things that go on in the body that we have no idea what it's stemming from but we can dig deep and that's the point is learning how to find out what's really going on and that's just i always say what's going on the top of my emotional will that you know if you go into the other workshop it's just what's going on that's it what's going on well this is going on 
And that's how I do therapy. So it's like, okay, so here's a relational. We don't understand that this is chronic. Developmental is chronic. A physical, mental, I mean, medical trauma can be chronic. A physical illness, of course, can be chronic, right? You have diabetes or you've had a car, you've had a traumatic brain injury, a TBI. Um, so these are ongoing and, oh, wait, I had a relational betrayal. Uh, my, my spouse uh, cheated on me, um, secretly, you know, had an addiction. Well, that's, that's relational trauma or betrayal trauma. Same thing. Domestic violence. I, I am, um, I've worked with a lot of domestic violence and i worked with the offenders and anger management and, um, and substance abuse. So, and for the offenders. And so here's domestic violence. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely traumatic. That's why child abuse is the charge when you have domestic violence in front of a child. It's a child abuse charge because we know that domestic violence changes a child's brain in one domestic violence incident. It changes a child's brain. So if that's not chronic, if that doesn't change a child's brain, now that's kind of like, oh, well, then I'm just screwed. My child's screwed. Everybody's screwed. You know, we're going to talk about that. But no, it changes their brain. But we know that we can, we can rewire the brain. So we can change the brain back to different ways. Absolutely. So um, developmental is like a bond break. So, so if you think about, I call it a bond break. So zero to three is when we, when we have an attachment to our caregivers. And if there's a divorce, if someone leaves, if someone dies, then that means there's a bond break is what I call it. So I, I go through, okay, here's, you know, you can write down your, a timeline of your life. Think about some bond breaks that happen, like a grandma died or, you know, a, a brother left and you were the youngest and your brother left out of the home and you were really attached to that brother. Um, and, you know, that was traumatic for you. So that could be a bond break. So there's fear, abandonment, strict upbringing. So there's a whole bunch on this that's very interesting that I listened to in this trauma workshop um, over the past two, you know, about a week um, that I didn't really understand very deeply is this an inherited family um, developmental trauma. I mean, do you think that we inherit our trauma from our parents and from our grandparents and from their grandparents? I mean, is it genetic or is it environmental? That's up for debate. I love um the whole analogy that genes are only activated by inflammation. It's about 99%. We all have genes inside of us from our parents, from our inheritance. We have a gene, but that does not mean that it's inherited that we're going to be um, schizophrenic. There's a 99% chance that that's actually not true. And that's from the, the newest research in neuroscience. There's no such thing as an inheritant, honestly, 99.1% of our genes can be activated by the gene itself. It's our environment that activates that. It's our body, it's our inflammation. So we are, because a lot of people have a, a, a cancer gene or a diabetic, diabetic gene from their parents or a high cholesterol gene, but it's not activated, right? So think about it, it's not activated. Because of our environment inside of our body, we're not sending cortisol and inflammation to our body all the time. We're not stressed out. We're eating right. We're sleeping. So all those things keep us in balance. Now, you can do all those things, and that gene can still be activated, of course, right? You can still get cancer. Your gene cancer, uh, your cancer gene is activated, and you can do all the right things. So there's some sort of, of, of a lot more research that needs to be done about that inherited developmental trauma that is crazy right i mean of course i inherited my dad's grandpa's side <laughs> I, I totally did you know but it's like okay but i hope to inherit my grandma and my mom's side you know so I, I never knew any of my grandfathers but um so and then here's this physical okay so that's that's just self-explanatory i gotta move on so acute adjustment Okay, I call it adjustment stress instead of adjustment disorder. So acute stress disorder and adjustment disorder is actually what they are. 
So natural disaster, bullying, moving. I always ask kids if they've moved schools, moved bedrooms, moved, 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 anything. Every single year when we start school, I say, is this the same school you were in before? It is extremely an acute stress to move schools. Um, and it can be traumatic. Absolutely. And then physiological trauma, that's that war. Secondary witness means that you were a secondary to it. Um, someone had a suicide attempt, and that's a psychological trauma for the people around them and for them. Okay. So let me go back to secondary witness really quick for the love. We are coming up on 9 11 again, right? Right. September 11th, we go through this routine every year and we remind ourselves of the towers being hit. We watch it on TV, we re traumatize ourselves 100%, and we watch it over and over and over again. There is so much statistics on what that does to our brain. It actually re the people that watch it over and over and over again have more acute stress than the people that were on ground zero that actually it happened to. They have more trauma. Why do we watch this stuff over and over and over and over again? It's really hard to um, avoid, um, but go somewhere. Go somewhere without internet. Go somewhere without electricity. Go somewhere without your phones. Limit it very, very short. So all these kids, I've done videos on this before for parents. When we had school shootings, when we had the Boston bombing, do not watch it again and again and again. It's psychological trauma. It's secondary trauma. Okay, that's my little soapbox there. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, yes. So just news in general. So we're going to get to the unknowns in a minute and how that's so traumatic. We don't see we, un, we unknown and un, un, unknown traumas and unseen traumas are so, so horrible. So natural disasters, you know, it can be an acute stress. And I'm going to talk about what that means in a minute. But I mean, I've been through two. I've been evacuated from my house when my kids were pretty small um, uh, twice um, from a mudslide and the uh, fire first that caused the mudslide the following year. Um, and, and it's, and there is some serious acute stress that comes back from from that disaster that happened actually um 18 years ago so i have to because i can i know because i went into preterm labor that night with my last child that's almost 18. <laughs> so <laughs> secondary trauma it's kind of like secondary witness but it's secondary trauma so it's from the outside from our environment so like your job so do you think I have secondary trauma from listening to people's trauma story? I have to watch that very, very closely because that's called transference or counter-transference. So, so I have people that come into therapy that work with other clients too that, that, that describe secondary trauma. So a child that they're working with like, you know, in a treatment center or something, um, you know, attempt suicide. So then they are reminded about their suicidality when they were a teen, right? So that's secondary trauma that triggers that. Okay, so shame trauma. Type one is, is, is not chronic. It can be a short-term, one-time incident, but shame trauma is different. So I have this little, I don't know how, I, I wanted to put it like on both sides, but it's, but it can be, Temporary, it can be bullying, like shame and being bullied, you know, being bullied. Um, it can be addiction and suicidality and breaking social norms um, and oppression. So, but that can be a one time thing or it can be chronic, right? So, if shame's repeated and you have developmental shame from childhood and, and, you're, and you're breaking social norms that you're family of origin, family unit, um, societal, you know, cultural, people said that that wasn't normal, you can't do that, and you keep breaking societal norms in your family unit, in your society, in your culture, and you're completely, repeatedly shamed for it, that is extremely traumatic. 
So that's that slide. <laughs> that's, it's just harm to yourself or others in a mental, physical, emotional, sexual. And I was just going to add, I wrote it down and I didn't add it to that spiritual balance. Your physical, mental, emotional, sexual abuse or neglect and add spiritual to that. So if it breaks your spirit, breaks your emotion, physical, mental, or sexual needs and balance, it, it, it's trauma. So on to the next slide, um, relational trauma. So I'm going to go through each one a little bit quickly. So relational trauma. So dive into this one a little bit. Death, divorce, domestic violence, like we talked about, betrayal and bond break. So when we have a relational trauma, that gets into attachment. Um, your caregiver died when you were young, um, or a parent, or you know, a grandma, or a sister. Um, so that's a bond break, um, trauma bonding. Okay, so this is the other side of the unhealthy part of relational trauma. That's called trauma bonding. So here's a bond break with a, a caregiver, but here's trauma bonding. So as a loyalty to a person who is destructive, and the trauma bonds are unhealthy. The misuse of fear, excitement, sexual feelings, sexual, um, you know, issues and entangled with another person. My definition of that is a syndrome because I have a whole other book on that. And that's a whole other class too. The syndrome cycle with an emotional manipulator and a codependent that's harmful and abusive. So we get in this trauma bond where it's an, it's a syndrome cycle. It's a syndrome. And that's how I explain it to um, couples and clients that I see that are have been in that and they've gotten out of it. And now they're seeking help for that healing of trauma. And they were in a trauma bond. It's domestic violence. It's betrayal. It's abuse. It's destructive. It's very manipulative. And you turn into, because the aggressor is with the passive. So that's the manipulator to the codependent, which is the passive. So that's why it's so scary. That's why passive behavior gets real deep and real abusive um, because it becomes um, a codependent sometimes. And I don't love that title, but that's just what it is. So, the, so in relationships, this is a relational trauma. I, these are all abusive and these are Gottman's Four Horsemen. And the book um, is, is referenced here in this article but of course he has dozens of books so and I didn't even reference it in the back but Gottman's Four Horsemen you just have to know that these are these these are abusive what happens with defensive brain this is your frontal lobes not defensive this is your defensive brain goes into criticism contempt defensiveness stone rolling so these are all things to work on and watch for because these turn into a trauma bond it really does. And I see couples that are so defensive and contempt and criticize defense, criticize defense, and, and then one shuts down. That's done one. That's, that's, that's a cycle. That is a trauma cycle. And if you want to watch um, a really good PowerPoint, if you have someone in your life that is um, abusive and toxic, then a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a workshop called Boundaries with toxic people or toxic behavior. It's just behavior. They're, they're not toxic as a person. Their behavior is toxic. So boundaries with a toxic person. You have to understand what that looks like and know that that's abusive, that's traumatic. And then you get into this triangle and that's that whole other class, um, the drama triangle that I call the trauma triangle. I actually renamed it. The, the model was called in the 60s. Um, drama triangle. I call it the trauma triangle because it's abusive. And these are always going on, these four horsemen, and you're in a trauma bond that is abusive, you know, usually. And then that triangle teaches you how to get out of the triangle and what that looks like. Um, so now we're going to move on to developmental trauma. So multiple or chronic exposure to forms of developmentally um, interpersonal trauma abandonment, betrayal, physical assault, sexual assault, threats to the body, um, emotional abuse, witnessing violence and death. Um, so these are developmental 
when your brain is still developing. So honestly, um, adolescence brain and everybody, you know, you've got till 26, your brain's developing till you're 26. So from zero to 26 to me is the developmental period. So your brain is very vital, vital and needs to develop correctly without um, these things. So, but that's impossible because we have lots of traumas in our life. So we have to create um, a sense of power if we have had our power taken away by betrayal and assaults and abuse and um, witness, you know, violence. And so um, PTSD, um, it does not capture at all that diagnosis does not capture the development and how the effects of childhood trauma is is on their development we don't go into childhood things when people come out with ptsd on the other side as an adult what what's wrong with that what, what wait a minute wait there's childhood trauma and then as an adult you go into a secondary trauma from that childhood trauma and those are all compounded on each other. So we, we've got a lot of work to do with that. Single most important public health challenge in the United States each year, more than 3 million children reported to authorities for abuse and neglect. I was a foster parent of 25 kids in a 10 year period. I know all about that personally. I was a crisis center. So traumatic medical and surgical procedures. I mean, think about it. A very, children go through a lot of traumatic medical procedures, um, if they have chronic illness, that's traumatic. Um, victims of accidents um, and violence. Most traumas beginning at home, though, this is not like that's the, that's the twenty percent of the developmental trauma. Eighty percent of developmental trauma are mistreatment at home by their own parents. Um, there's other countries that do way better than Western medicine at this. They have preventative. They have proactive. Um, situations for children and abuse and there's very low um abuse in other countries compared to the u.s we have the highest you know incarceration and we have the highest abuse levels we don't have very many um pre and proactive um i guess you know um <laughs> uh, yeah just pre like you know preventative um, measures that we fund in the U.S. to prevent more child abuse. But it is a serious problem that comes out on the other side. So let's talk about shame because shame is the root or is trauma the root and shame is the root of trauma or is, is, or is shame what re-traumatizes us? So there is a egg and chicken thing here. And I love my chickens and my eggs, by the way. So, you know, it's like, I love, it's like, okay, chicken or egg. Is it the chicken or the egg? Is it shame that causes the trauma or is the trauma causing the shame? You know, it's so intertwined. So we just have to know that um, shame is a huge part of this. It's the most related people that suffer from shame continuously. It's the most related to PTSD. Um, in mirroring, so shame, PTSD, so post-traumatic, because shame is ongoing. If it's an ongoing thing, remember, if it's chronic, um, it's it's really damaging. So once again, defense mechanism, fight, flight, or freeze. Our fear brain is the automatic built-in protective system. Okay, and this is how our brain goes. We have a thought, we have that physical, we have a feeling. Oh, we have a behavior, and so we have to break that up and go, okay, let's be in the frontal lobes and not in our defense brain, but that's really tough when you're in a post-traumatic situation. 85% of men and women interviewed for shame research could recall a school incident being shamed in their childhood. Um, 85%. So 50% experienced shame in their faith history and they found resilience and healing through spirituality. So they had to heal through their own spirituality because of their faith crisis. Um, what's shame? Um, all that you need to know here, and you can read this later, is shame is the focus on self. Guilt is the focus on behavior. So shame is I am bad, 
guilt is I did something bad. So what what's what's worse than you know going into a trauma and having something happen to you and have yourself be shamed internally by yourself and others. I'm a bad person now because I was raped. I'm a bad person because I um you know stayed in an abusive relationship. Okay. And why well why didn't you just leave? Extreme shame or you know so so just just know that this is um, a primary emotion that causes extreme flawed feelings and insecurity and weakness and unsafety and, and very betrayed. So um, you got to leave it behind. That's a really tough journey. Uh, Brene Brown's given us 20 years of research on that. So you can figure that out in, in some of that in, in therapy. And there's lots of references in the back of this to her books. Um, but there's very simple ways to combat shame, honestly. Number one, it's connection. Our fixed mindset and old programming, this is my words, um, that our culture and our family of origin give us seem to be easily robbed from the now. So change it to growth and grow within you to, to the present, right? So it robs the now, it hijacks the now, and we go into the past and the future, but we have to grow. Um, within us right now um, and so this is how it how you grow empathy I love growing too. growing you know I have two big gardens so it's like here's growth besides mountains reservoirs and food I like to grow so <laughs> grow things so you grow empathy and you kill shame it's you know yeah don't don't feed it don't water shame so how do you not water shame well, you got to get creative. You got to play. You got to have courage, connection, compassion, being seen and heard, bravery, um, spirituality, getting in the swamp is what Brene Brown calls that fourth grade. Guess what happens in fourth grade? I am now predicting it's not fourth grade. It is second and third grade because we're starting at like under 10 years old. I am having lots of eight-year-olds to 14-year-olds extremely struggling in practice so it's like what is going on that's so young so fourth grade she says oh we compare ourselves in fourth grade that is when bullying starts that is when we want to love and belong and and we don't feel understood and we compare ourselves to others we've got to stand up and go what is happening in third and fourth grade that we can teach our kids shame resilience to grow empathy because that's the opposite of shame. I'm going to have empathy for you instead of bully you. You can kill it. We got to kill it. Violence and depression and bullying, grow it. And what are we doing? Violence, sadness, creativity, and connection. Those things have been robbed from us the last six months. And we've gotten into more of this, or it hasn't been robbed from us. And we've connected to what's more important, our family, our home, the earth. We have been more connected to the earth and to the universe, because guess what? 75% more than ever before in, in, in U.S. history, we are visiting our lakes and re re reservoirs and our state parks in record numbers. And we've, we've bought a lot of you know, SUVs and four wheelers and wave runners and boats. It's fantastic. Get out, right? What's happened? I don't, I don't, I've never seen so many people out. I'm like, go home. These, I've been here for years to these reservoirs. Go somewhere else. I want to camp here, you know? I'm like, holy cow. Yeah. Record, record numbers at a reservoir that I go to where my dad's cabin is. It's like, it's a small place and I don't tell people where it is. So I'm not going to tell any, you know, y'all, you hundred people in here, I'm not going to tell you where it is, but it's like, Hmm, it's busy. So are we connecting in a different way? Yes, absolutely. And it is very hard to get spirituality back after trauma, connecting with the greater power than ourselves. Hello. Like, because that's what shame grows. It, it grows 
you not connecting and celebrating. I celebrate emotion. I celebrate trauma. I celebrate hard times. I celebrate these things with people and they think I'm crazy sometimes. I validate that it's not fun, but then here's how we celebrate that and how we connect to something bigger and confront someone else's suffering, our, our own suffering, right? So compassion. So um, how do we tune in? How do we connect? How do we be courageous? And the biggest part of that, the second one down here is creativity. We got to get creative. And so what, what happens um, when in May, I had like several families that were so disappointed because they had Hawaii booked, they had graduation plans, they had all this celebration for a reward system of working so hard for the whole year and it was all ripped from them, right? So guess what we did? We had to get creative. You have to, for four or five days straight, you're gonna take off time, you're gonna pretend you're in Hawaii and you're gonna get every kind of food, you're gonna spend $300 on, on decorations and you're gonna pretend that you're on a plane and I don't care what you do, but you gotta get creative. So that's just an example of like, okay, we're gonna pretend that we had um, our reward system and then we're gonna go somewhere else and spend time together but you know, it wasn't Hawaii, but we can pretend that it was. So you gotta get creative. So let's see. Um, see, I knew I was, there's so much. Um, how does it, how does shame survive? Just look at this list. Trauma, perfectionism, worthlessness, judgment, and secrecy. Shame hates the story to be told. What? is more prevalent in a story not being told than trauma. The family secret, the rape, the, the little developmental you know, things that happened as, as children. You uh, don't tell that story. I, it's amazing to me as a clinician, honestly, I'm so every single day extremely um, moved by people's stories and their stories that they have never, ever, ever told anyone. And this is like maybe on my first visit with them or their second ever. And I'm like, so who else knows about this? Absolutely no one. They've held that as their own judgment and criticism and shame and worthlessness and disconnection that they're not enough to tell that story. Shame hates the story to be told, just know that. And the thing is, is with that said, my favorite, almost my favorite, favorite thing from Brene Brown is, but people have to earn the right to hear your story. So you just don't tell your story to anybody. I don't know how I earned the right, but you just, it's a safe place, it's a safe person. So if you're in, if you're in a safe space with somebody, you have earned the right to hear their story. And please just listen and let them tell their story. There's nothing to do about it, but stay out of shame when you're telling that story. And it's so extremely healing. You got to tell the story, but you got to tell it to people that earn the right to hear the story. So you got to trust them. So chemicals are past learned emotions. What's that? Post trauma. It's just post trauma. So they're all past chemicals that we hold in our body. Um, lots and lots of research on that. I completely believe that. I'm a clinician, but I'm certainly a naturalist. What we hold in our body, and I'm very, very big on nutrition and supplements and how to heal the body from the inside because there is genes that are activated from this chemical. So whatever buried feelings... Oh, and I forgot to add that to my, my PowerPoint uh, references. So in the last one, in the emotional uh, intelligence class, I talked about the book. Um, it's called um, Buried Feelings. It is right here. Buried Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. So um, feelings buried alive never die. That's what that buried feelings. And here's your belief system behind them. So that's Carol uh, Truman. But, you know, it's like, here's our belief system behind them. 
And that's what I'm going to probably teach next month is our belief system and thinking errors and our stories that we tell ourselves behind our family of origin, our society, what we're supposed to do. And then we end up having lots of thinking or stories around that. So we got to get to the root. So let's get to the root real quick. We got like five minutes. I knew I would be pretty. So here's my root. Um, I've shown this before too. I've taught this in my, my um, thinking ears class. So leafy issues are just something that other people might not see. It's your junk values, it's your thinking errors, it's your addiction, it's your financial issues, it's a, you lost your driver's license because you got a DUI. But nobody knows that, right? Nobody knows you got a DUI, nobody knows that you lost your driver's license. It's a leafy issue. So it's a failed relationship. Well, what's really going on is the secondary emotions. So you have to know what your secondary emotions are when you're dealing with the root issue. Because I'm talking about this is because this shame and trauma is in the root issue. So. So when I taught, when this one was on the um, emotional class last week, someone asked, well, how do I know my root issues? Well, there's a little list right there for you. And we sometimes don't know what they are until we really go into some treatment. Um, but you can guess it's loss, grief, and trauma. It's relational trauma. It's your self-concept. It's shame. Shame is, I can say, always in the root issue. So you have to go back to your shame story. When did I tell myself I was dumb? Well, I was in the fourth grade when I went into um, resource is what they called it. And the teacher looked at me and shamed me and treated me very badly. And I'm pretty sure they told me I was dumb. That stayed with me for 40 years. And I did EMDR last year. I just self-disclosed some. I was just thinking about that. I did some EMDR myself last year in June, a year ago. And that's what came up when I did EMDR. I didn't even know it. So I had to go take my clinical test. And I had failed my clinical test. So I had to go to my root issue. I, it wasn't about the test. It wasn't about studying for the test. It wasn't about anything. It was about my denial of shame and how... I thought I'd gotten rid of that story that I could pass this test and I hadn't. And EMDR is one of the only modalities and treatments for PTSD and trauma. And, and, you know, of course I've always wanted to be certified in it. So that's coming in September and October. I'm getting certified in it. I'm super excited. It's a long process. It's a very big certification. It's not just an easy, it, it's very, don't go to anybody um, for treatment that is not specialized and certified in EMDR or certified in trauma treatment. Um, this is just a little bit of burnout. What happens in all of our burnouts, in any kind of burnout, especially from trauma. So we have all four categories here, um, our stages of burnout. Um, and I'm just going to leave that slide there. And when we send you the PowerPoint, you can look at it closer. A little bit of PTSD stuff because it's our only thing that's really uh, DSM diagnosed, you know, PTSD. Of course, everyone's heard that. That's majorly in the back of the brain. You're in your post and pre brain, you're not in the present. Um, it's, it's, it can happen with any of these traumas that I've talked about. So please know that. As it doesn't get taken care of, it turns into PTSD, which is the next slide. So um, once again, this last quote on the bottom, and I'm not going to take time to watch his little YouTube channel, but that's the link to it. It's, it's like two, two minutes long about the top three things about um, trauma and PTSD. So that's the little YouTube um, watch uh, if you want to. But connecting with others, allowing ourselves to know and understand what is going on with us. Once again, taking medications, okay, they shut down the inappropriate alarm systems, the alarm reaction, so medications can help from the bottom up by allowing the body to have the experiences that deeply, um, conversively um, contradict and helpless rage collapse that is a result of trauma. He talks about collapse as freeze. So he calls freeze as collapse. So I, I, I totally love that word. 
your body actually and your brain and your body collapse when you get to a freeze mode and um, that's what happens express especially with trauma and after trauma is you'll freeze which is stonewalling stuffing um and passive behavior so those are all the same thing so that what i was talking about earlier was that acute stress adjustment and then post-traumatic so you've got to understand that unknowns and unseen turn into this so an acute stress it's just an acute stress kids starting school uh moving um a one month situation where you have symptoms of acute stress after a disaster after a bombing we have this acute stress um after these crises they're crisis we we go through these different crises but it can only sometimes the symptoms can only last one month so when we had the earthquake it was about six weeks where most of my clients got back to normal sleep rhythm um normal jumpy they weren't so jumpy um i had many kids and parents tell me that garbage trucks bothered them because it sounded exactly the same sound as that earthquake and we've almost forgot about that earthquake i mean right we don't talk about it anymore it's like oh that was that's okay just a pandemic and an earthquake in one month that's no big deal it was that month and we kind of moved through it because it didn't happen again right so that was an acute stress because we were wondering if it was going to happen again and then we went to bed and then we had aftershocks right so if it's not treated and and that that kiddo didn't have a caregiver that that soothed them that soothed them that soothed them that soothed them soothed every time that they had a stress about it it, it they usually will not have chronic stress from it later but if it doesn't it goes into an adjustment disorder for six months and if that adjustment stays around for six months and it's not treated it turns into post-traumatic so treatment in those six months is crucial for loss and grief treatment and trauma and powerless so if you're in those unseen and unknown i mean i mean uh it was about a year ago uh more than a year ago i had a teen come in and it was right after she had witnessed her best friend dead in his car after suffocating himself with suicide. And she's the one that she was the first one on the scene. And I mean, she was 17, he was 17. They were seniors in high school. Um, and that acute stress, right? If that's not dealt with within those six months um, with treatment, we're gonna have post-traumatic, which is when she smells something, sees something, she touched you know his skin that was all these five senses that came up for her um and she needed long-term care for that traumatic experience it's going to be with her but if she gets treatment she will have power over it so these are just a little fun slide about reactive and proactive so one's present reactive is um one's you know present and past okay so my p words so past is reactive proactive is present okay so it's like i should just put present and past up there but i like so reactive you're going to react to your fight flight or freeze or you're going to be proactive and know ahead of time what is going on so this is what you, happens when you have reactive brain and this is what happens on this side of the slide when you're proactive and you're in the present you have compassion you can accept it you're going to connect with your unharmed so i just love that it came from you know one of these books and and um and this other workshop that they talked about that the part of you that's unharmed connect with that you know and attune to your hurt attune to it and attune to your shame and then release it and then you're grounded and more powerful and more balanced so if you have pain, you know, turn it to pleasure. And perfectionism does not work. It is the root of, of shame and, and trauma. Um, we turn into this perfectionism people of like, we think we have to be perfect now. We want to be imperfect. Um, permanent trauma does not have to be permanent. Um, reacting in your brain is not permanent. We can be pliable because we can change the brain. We can change the neural pathways because we can have physical actual change in the brain we know that now so if we're protective 
we need to, we just get too protective we just need to play if you, if you are a protector and you're too protective and controlling you need to turn it to play and panic turns to pace if you can pace yourself if you can pace your breath we're going to not be in panic stage as much or we're going to manage our panic i'm never going to be able to take away your panic but i can help you pace it and reduce it and that's what I do. I am a manager and a reducer. There's no such thing as perfectionism in taking any of our pain away or our suffering or our overwhelm or our denial or our depression or anxiety or fatigue or shame or thinking errors. But we definitely can reduce and manage and completely get back our power. And I totally believe that. And this is some treatment for trauma. EMDR I talked about, exposure therapy, um, cognitive behavioral. That's basically the top three, you know, exposure, a little bit of cognitive processing, of course, but it's really cognitive behavioral after that, because you have to change your behavior and your thoughts. And that's that thinking error class that is that behavioral part, cognitive behavioral. Um, and here's a meditation, and I'm out of time. So I'm going to leave this up. Um, and it's um, just something you can do um it's it's just a daily mindful loving meditation that you can go through um and then here's my references so let's chat who has questions okay so someone said how hard is it to get your spiritual back after the trauma hard because it's so just let's say just in general balance so your four balances are physical, mental, social, and emotional slash spiritual. So you need to go into your emotional because emotional and spiritual go together for me in our balance. So how do we get our balance back? That's the question. Well, number one in any research and shame resilience and how to get our shame to go away and be resilient against it is boundaries. So we have to put up a boundary. We have to know what our balance is. If your spiritual balance is off, and you have lost and felt like you've died inside your spirit is what I gather is that I can't get that back because I feel like I've died inside. It might not be your spiritual. It might just be your, your soul and a little bit more of your self worth because that's what, that's what trauma does to us. It kills us. It kills us sometimes inside. So it's, it's a little bit of dig, digging deep into your root issue of balance. So that helps. Okay. And this one is, what are some ways to explain that something that someone is doing is hard on you mentally and emotionally when they don't think it is? For example, my family always says things about my tattoos slash piercings. They think they are just teasing me, but it really upsets me. That's just passive aggressive behavior. Yeah, it's not teasing. So, so you're right. It's not teasing and there has to be a boundary put up around that. And so once again, how do you do a, an assertive boundary? I feel like I need you to, and I'm willing to not bring this up again because I don't want this to happen again. Or so the thing is, is that's a hundred percent shame and it's not teasing. I had a rule in my house that you couldn't say, just kidding. It's like, oh, are you going to really wear those shoes to school? Just kidding. They look fine on you. I mean, how did that make you feel? I mean, it's stupid. It's passive aggressive behavior that turns into ma manipulation. And when you say just kidding, it's a manipulation. And then you just say, oh, I was just teasing. Don't take it so personal. I love that statement. I'm like, hmm. So it's my fault that I got offended now because you completely labeled me and gave me a thinking error and blah, 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 right? So. Yeah, so, so you might have to put a boundary around that and say, you know what, actually it's very shameful that you make fun of me. And I need you to stop that. And I feel like it's just hurtful. And you're attacking me personally about my tattoos and my t piercings. And, and I take it, you know, it, it, it's an, a personal attack. It's very passive aggressive, so not okay. Is that good? Who else, we had time. <laughs> And then someone said, can you reference the study stating that genetics are not responsible for predisposition for behavioral health diagnoses? Yeah, actually. 
um, it's from, I mean, it's from one of my workshops and the guy, um, so there is, it's right here. 99% of lifestyle is, is the cause of, um, of, from the environment and it's not from disease. So 1% comes from birth and that is Joe Dispenzia, D-I-S-P-E-N-Z-A. So he talks about his, you know, there's lots of research on this, genes that get regulated um, from a habit of environment. So if you say, well, anxiety came from my mom because she, she lives with anxiety, her grandma and, or her mom was, was anxious, and so I'm, I'm pretty much, I get anxiety from my mom. It's not a gene. It's from your environment on how she dealt with a stressful situation. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's what I mean by that. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, you produce new genes when you have different environments. So you can actually combat those genes, right? So environment in your body, environment in your, you know, in your outside world and your, and I've talked about cleaning up your environment in other workshops. So stress causes your genes to activate. So if you're not a stressful person and you're not an anxious person from that environment, those genes won't activate. So, okay. Then someone said, what did you say that trauma disconnects? I couldn't write it down fast enough. So what does trauma disconnect? Um, everything. Every single thing. And one slide talks about how it disconnects us from this inside our body. It disconnects us spiritually emotionally, physically, and mentally. So that's your balance. So that's all you need to know. It disconnects everything. So, so we have to go, okay, we disconnects relationships, right? It disconnects social, emotional, mental, physical, especially spiritual. So 